Hi, I'm Susan Newman Reville, and I'm here to talk about my dad, Howard Newman, who started in early television in Oklahoma City. I remember so many things, and it's like a crazy quilt of memories. So many of my things are from the point of view of a child. But I think he officed in the Palmolive Building, downtown Chicago. He got, uh, he started, you know, on the, on the bottom as a copywriter, and of course got into radio and wrote a lot of commercials for radio. Now, one reason he got into advertising is because his cousin, his older cousin, Milton Schwartz, was a big wig ad guy in Chicago who um, actually helped produce the Bob Hope Show. Uh, one of his clients was Pepsodent, which was an old toothpaste. And my cousin, uh, my father's cousin, Milton Schwartz, wrote, you'll wonder where the yellow went when you brush your teeth with Pepsodent. And he also had Pillsbury and created the Doughboy. In fact, my cousin Bill Schwartz, his son, who now lives in Tasmania, uh, was the first voice of the Pillsbury Doughboy. So my father was surrounded by ad types. He, one day, he told me, one day, uh, some people came over from another building and asked if anyone in the agency had any information or experience with this new technology. I don't know that they use the word technology, but this new medium called television. So when the people came from this unknown place, came uh, and asked if anyone in the agency knew anything about television, my father, who had never probably even seen one, volunteered and said, sure, I can do it. And so he went over with the folks and he directed his first television show. And I wish I knew what it was. That just started. He learned a lot. He learned really fast. My dad was really bright and he was also ambitious. And so that started his journey there in, uh, in television. But he also, you know, did a lot of print ads. He did a lot of, um, of radio. I actually have in a trunk some of the copies of the print ads that he had originally written for Esquire magazine. And this is when the ads were a page and it looked like a small short story on the page. I remember one car ad I read that he had written and, and the copy took up almost three-fourths of the page. So he had a lot of experience in writing. Everything went well in Chicago. My parents moved from the metro area of Chicago up on the lake in Highland Park. My dad, like every other guy of the time in the late 40s, post-war people, took the train into Chicago, took the train back. It was about two and a half, three hour commute every day. My mom got a little tired. I came along. Everything was a little difficult. Um, one car family, which everyone had for years and years. Anyway, long story short, they decided to look into Oklahoma City, her home base. Well, my father, being a Chicago City boy who had never lived except for the war anywhere else, didn't know what he would do for a living down here and had no idea there were ad agencies in Oklahoma City. At the time, Low Runkle had continued an advertising agency. It had started before the war. And when he came home, he started it up again. So when they moved back here about 1950, might have been late 49, uh, and I was little, little baby, um, my dad went to work for Low Runkle. And that's where he stayed until the early 80s. And that's where a lot of this history takes place. At the time, WKY was the leading station uh, both in radio and in the, the, the baby television industry and so it was just right up my dad's alley and he got involved with some early early television shows now at this time at least from my perspective what the ad guys did was their sponsor sponsored the show but because my dad had quite a bit of experience by this time at least as much as anyone else in television he also directed and produced many of these shows and so one of the earliest ones that I can remember is the Big Red Shindig sponsored by I think it was Evans Big Red Warehouse and it was basically a country and western show all of these shows were live and my dad went out every week. Um, he spent a lot of time at WKY 
on Britton Road. Well, no, I take that back. First at the Municipal Auditorium in Oklahoma City. I'll get to that in a moment. And he would do live commercials and he also directed and produced the show. Now one of my earliest memories as a child is at Municipal Auditorium, which is now the Civic Center Musical in Oklahoma City, where the original television station was. And I would take great pleasure in running up and down what I thought was an endless ramp at this huge auditorium. And I think that's how I entertained myself when all of the quote, quote, boring grown-up stuff was going on. However, one of my also earliest memories was sitting on a singer named Larry Cotton's lap while he asked me if I wanted him to sing me a song. This was the Gizmo Goodkin Show. Gizmo Goodkin was a marionette and um, I do, he, in my mind he looked a little like E.T. I don't know what he really looked like, but that's how the years have told me he looks. And he was a funny little puppet that I watched all the time. And so there I was in my, now this is, this is how memory is strange to me. I remember it as if it were a photograph. I had on a navy blue pleated skirt with little suspenders and a white blouse. I don't remember sometimes what I fixed for dinner yesterday, but I sure remember that dress. And so I was sitting on Larry Cotton's lap and I remember he said, would you like me to sing you a song, Susie? And I said, no because I thought that was really boring. And I remember doing it because my mom and dad were off camera and there were washing machines and dryers around because I guess we're sponsored by someone who sold washing machines. And I remember everybody laughed. And so he sang anyway and I just kind of squirmed and, and that's an early memory of the Municipal Auditorium and early television. Well, Gizmo Goodkin, the local puppet, was at the same time, of course, of Howdy Doody, of um, Smiling Ed and his show, I've Got Shoes, You've Got Shoes, Everybody's Gotta Have Shoes, sponsored by Buster Brown Shoes somewhere, with Midnight the Dancing Cat and Plunk Your Magic Twanger Froggy. All these things were things I grew up with and are very, very early memories, not to mention you know, the Lone Ranger, Hoplon Cassidy, and other things like that. Um, other things that were happening here at the same time were, uh, I mentioned the Big Red Shindig. My dad also produced and hosted a show called What's Behind Your Telephone for Southwestern Bell. I'm not sure it was called Southwestern Bell then, but for the Bell Telephone Company. And he had to drive up to Tulsa every Wednesday afternoon, and sometimes we would go with him. My little brother Steve, my mom, and me. And we would go with him, um, and he co-hosted with Mari Ferguson, who was also an early name in Oklahoma City Television. And what happened with What's Behind Your Telephone is they went all over the state of Oklahoma filming all kinds of interesting sites and events, historical places, interviewing people with the idea that the telephone is the thing that joins it all together. Well, it was wonderful for us because we got to go every weekend, and believe me, it was every weekend during nice weather seasons that we went somewhere in Oklahoma. And it well, might have been a day trip or it might have been an overnighter, but I got to sit on the great Indian artist A.C. Blue Eagle's lap and hear stories in Tahlequah. We went to Tishomingo. I re these are things I remember. I remember almost stepping on a copperhead snake and having a lot of people run over and grab me. These are little kid memories. But we, as children, got introduced to all kinds of things. We went to every state park. Uh, we really developed a love for our state which continues to this day and even with my own children. 
And I appreciate that show so much. And I don't know how long that was on the air, but it was a really interesting show, at least from our point of view. Another show my dad produced and hosted was for the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation. Now, OMRF held a place in my father's heart for his whole life for various reasons. He started this show, he, he sold this show, and by the way, he sold these show ideas through the ad agency, Low Runkle, to these entities. And of course, they were all done under the auspices of WKY-TV. He sold this show to Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation because Dr. Stuart Wolf, who was eventually dean of the medical school and a tremendous researcher with a national reputation, was based at OU at that time. And he went to Dr. Wolf and proposed this television show that would be co-hosted with Dr. Wolf. My father had come up with a slogan for OMRF called that, uh, uh, a logo that said, That More May Live Longer. And that was the name of the television show, That More May Live Longer. And it was live every week here in, in Oklahoma City at WKY and Dr. Wolf and my dad would talk about medical issues and they would bring people on. I met Dr. Alexander Fleming, the discoverer of penicillin, and his little wife. I remember them as tiny, aged people. And I was little, my brother was little, my mother said, remember this day, this is important. And I remember that day because it was important. I got to meet them because they came to Oklahoma City um, I think originally to open Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation, but this was a subsequent visit when they were visiting Dr. Wolf and they were on the show. And that was a, a show that was dear to my father's heart. When I was seven years old uh, and my dad was doing all these shows, he uh, got ill over Thanksgiving holidays and since he officed downtown, he was down there a lot and, and the day he fell on the sidewalk and couldn't get up, uh, was a very memorable day of our family. He was diagnosed with uh, flu for two weeks and what he actually had was polio. This is right before the uh, polio vaccine came out, I mean within months. My father spent eight weeks at the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation with an experimental polio treatment called the Sister Kinney Method and that he recovered. He's one of the lucky ones who didn't lose much usage of his legs, although later on in life as he got tired uh, once in a while, those of us who knew he had a little limp, but that was to be expected. He'd been through a uh, terrible disease. And uh, he always had a love for Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation after that, and they honored him in later years. So that was one of his favorite shows. Now, all of these times he was running around Oklahoma doing these shows, and whenever he had to go away from the station, Johnny Shannon, a great photographer, was always by his side. And I grew up thinking of Johnny Shannon almost as Uncle Johnny. We spent a lot of time at his home, and he and his family would come over to our house, and we spent a lot of time together. Now. We're in Oklahoma City. The station has been moved from the, from the Municipal Auditorium to its new building on Britain Road. And one of the shows that my father created and hosted, produced, and didn't direct, but his friend Joe Jerkins did for many, many, many years, and then Bill Thrash took over as director, was the first coaches show in the nation. Now I'm told that Woody Hayes differed with my father and said that his show premiered the year before. But history shows and documents show that that's not the truth. My father went to Bud Wilkinson and uh, the OU football establishment on behalf of a client of his and said, I have an idea for a show because my father's love of football you know, never ceased. And they created the Bud Wilkinson Show. Now later on, that became incorporated. Ned Hockman, the great film uh, guru at OU, uh, who also did work at WKY, and my father and Bud Wilkinson later formed a small corporation and syndicated the show. But it started at WKY, 
with Bud Wilkinson and my father asking him questions and the little men. Now the little men, there was a, a magnetic field made of metal that was penciled off or, or chalked off like a football field. And there were the little men who stuck to it and Coach Wilkinson would block out plays and describe plays with the little men. They became as important as uh, Coach Wilkinson and my dad. And the little men I had, actually, after my father passed away and my brother passed away, and we donated the little men to the Oklahoma History Museum. But there they were, and they spent many happy hours describing OU plays and interviewing OU players, and again, I, as a child, saw all of this happening. We often, my brother and I, would sit quietly off camera and we got to watch the show live. And of course, we got to spend some time at Coach Wilkinson's house and I had a secret crush on Jay Wilkinson and he doesn't know me from Adam, but that's an old memory that I probably should leave in my head. And it was a wonderful time. We got to go to all the football games at home when I say we got to go to them, it was a real hassle for me. I liked the band and the cheerleaders, but I was a little girl. And at that time, everybody dressed up for OU football games. My mother wore heels and you know, her good clothes, her jewelry, and it was a whole day event. Because even though the show was done at WTY, my father, being a pilot, flew the film crew to film the games all over the country, wherever the team went. And of course, on game days at Owen Field, they were up on the camera deck. At this time, women were not allowed in the press box, so the children and my mom, you know, we, the children and my mom, had to sit in the, in the stadium and wait to be, you know, see my dad once in a while. But it turned into a long day because when color was introduced at WKY, and I believe it's the first station that introduced color, at least this side of the Mississippi, um, the only place that processed color film was Dallas. And so what happened is those game days took, this is my point of view as a child, my whole Saturday. Because after the game, we would go to the airport and my dad would pile everybody in. There was Johnny Shannon, Joe Jerkins from the station, um, eventually Ron Turner from the station, sometimes Ned Hockman, my mother, my little brother, and I. Because let me tell you, my father did not leave us out of any of his projects. And I am so blessed to have these memories because of it. We would fly down to Dallas and we would eat at Phil's Delicatessen every single time. It was wonderful. But then we'd have to go to the film processing place where my brother and I played games until we fell asleep. And then in the wee hours of the morning, we would fly back. And then those guys would be at WKY all night editing film and hand splicing film. The coach's show was black and white first and then changed to color later on. But the same process happened during the black and white years too. And Charlene Carruthers, who also worked those all-nighters editing film, sometimes edited film even during the playback show on Sunday while the show was on because there was so much film and they were under such deadlines. Because they used the film that uh, my dad's film crew or the film crew from WKY that my dad kind of flew around, they used that film not only for the coaches show but also for the playback and the university used some of it also for their highlight films. Uh, those were wonderful years. My dad uh, did this until 1981 all the way through Barry Switzer and enjoyed uh, various beautiful sets at WKY that were done for the show. Just really, really beautiful and went through all of the coaches, including the short-lived short reign of, uh, of Jim McKenzie. And I remember my father speaking fondly of Jim McKenzie, whose life was cut so short at OU. And, and um, he had a wonderful time doing it. The OU Coaches Show encompassed a lot of OU history, and my dad got to work with and became friends with, of course, Bud Wilkinson and Chuck Fairbanks and Go Gomer Jones, Jim McKenzie. 
And of course, Barry Switzer. And Barry Switzer will always have a special place in my heart uh, because he did the eulogy at my father's funeral. And uh, before that, held my baby daughter when she was six months old because he was so kind to support my dad when my mom passed away. And so those relationships kind of go on, just like all the relationships at WKY TV. My father was there so much of the time, even though his office was in downtown Oklahoma City. And my memories are filled with people such as Joe Jerkins and Ned Hockman and Johnny Shannon and Roger Pishney whose brother came to our house every Christmas playing Santa Claus. I found this out, of course, as an adult. And um, other people, Prissy Thomas, Helen Webb and Joe Webster, um, singers, uh, Jane Hall, who is such a dear that I, as an adult, have been able to work with in some community theater and whom I adore. I have a picture, and Jane probably would not like to be reminded of this, but I have a picture safely put away somewhere that I'm sure I'll find someday of a picture at WKY TV, uh, black and white, on some set with a long couch. And on that couch are a bunch of little bitty children. I'm on the end. I'm next to Maury Ferguson's boy, Lance, who was a year older than I was. I think I'm four. Uh, Jane Hall's baby is at the other end of the couch, and I mean an infant. And I remember that day because Jane Hall's baby had pink satin shoes, and I would go over and touch them because secretly I wanted pink satin shoes like that baby. Anyway, I remember that day, and there's an actual picture. And behind the couch are my dad, Howard Newman, Jane Hall, and someone else I don't remember. And they're leaning on the couch, just grinning, because all the kids are there. Wonderful times. Absolutely wonderful times. My dad's association with WKY-TV and radio went on for years and years and years. In fact, in the... 1950s, and I'm trying to think about the dip, about 1955, probably. I think probably that was the year. Buddy Suggs, who was station manager at WKY TV, and E.K. Gaylord, who owned it, uh, paid for my dad and his family, including his mother from Chicago, my grandma Newman. Flew, uh, my dad flew us down to St. Petersburg, Florida because they wanted him to take a look at the station that Mr. Gaylord owned in St. Petersburg and see if he would be interested in managing that station. And uh, we spent a wonderful time there. It's the first time that I'd seen um, a large beach and we had a wonderful time. I, I was a child, of course, it was wonderful. And uh, my dad, you know, met a lot of people and looked over the station and ultimately chose not to relocate us to San, uh, St. Petersburg, but stayed in Oklahoma City in the advertising biz. So even though early on in my childhood, I thought that going to the OU games was rather tedious, later on, when I was in college, I really enjoyed it. And I would still go on some of the games and some of the away games. I got to meet um, Daryl Royal and, and uh, all kinds of uh, people. And that was a lot of fun. And then my uh, future husband, who had grown up across the street, who was also in college, was also invited on many football trips. My husband, Bill, William Reville. And eventually, we were married in 1972, and in those early marriage days, uh, we flew all over the country with my dad because at this time, they let women in the press box. So my job was to stay on the camera deck, no matter what the weather, all bundled up, and make runs down to the press box where they had glorious food, and to bring it up to the camera deck where Ron Turner, Johnny Shannon, my dad, my brother, who was four years younger than I, Steve Newman, uh, were filming the OU games. So I got to provide food for them and have some for myself, and it was wonderful. Of course, my attitude was totally changed. And my husband also learned to 
uh, shoot film for them. The university honored my dad in many ways, and he was honored to represent the university in a small area, the coaches show. He um, was made an associate member of the Varsity Letterman's Club, uh, the O Club, and I, I have his plaque, and he was very proud of that. Um, he was honored by a lot of other entities as well. You know, my dad was one of, uh, because he was downtown and in that early mix of the growth of Oklahoma City in the late 40s, post-war, all these guys coming home from war, starting their careers, and starting in this new medium of television. And the place to be, of course, was either WKY Radio, which had been around for a long time, or WKY TV. And um, he, he was in that group, and so uh, all the time, my growing up, I heard all these names mentioned that are historical when you talk about early television in early Oklahoma City. And his clients ranged from Meadow Gold Milk, which was an early sponsor of the OU Coaches Show, to, of course, Deep Rock Gas, which later was a was of course Kermit Oil and they they left off the Deep Rock. I remember his struggling one night at our breakfast room table with his typewriter and his usual stack of yellow typing paper. He would work long hours after dinner. We ate dinner about the same time every night and then we would go off and do our thing and my dad would sit there at the table and work, I don't know when he went to sleep, to the wee hours and my mom would clean up the pieces of wadded up paper and stacks of half written stuff that he'd started over. And that's where he did his writing. And I remember once he struggled and struggled with a jingle that he did for Kerr McGee for Deep Rock. And I remember the morning he said, I figured it out. And there was a whole campaign based on his slogan, Caps Off for Deep Rock. I mentioned Medigo Milk and Kermagee, that was a longtime client, Keynes Coffee, OG&E, did some wonderful things for OG&E when utilities actually advertised, big time advertising. I remember once, when I was in college, I was a member of um, the college a cappella choir, and he actually hired us to do a commercial. And when he did, he had a big sheepdog. Now, these seem like disparate elements, but it all worked in the commercial somehow. But he had hired a big sheepdog to be in a large tub that was going to be dragged in front of us as we sang the OG&E jingle. The trouble is, the day of the commercial, the woman with the sheepdog came to the station, WKY of course, and had shaved the sheepdog. It was this skinny, long-legged creature that no longer really fit what he wanted in this tub with the sheepdog. And so he had to borrow somebody's little pet dog and put it in there because the sheepdog looked awful. It really did look like a sheared sheep. And so he had to adjust it and it was hysterical. It was so funny. He told me years later, he said, if I ever write a book, the title's gonna be, But She Shaved the Sheepdog. So he did that, um, Delaney's, Evans, later on, he started his own agency with his good friend Nora Owens, the Owens Newman Agency, and left Low Runkel and had Taco Mayo and Snickle Chevrolet, Michener Ferrand, Bob Mills, lots of different clients. The WKY family kind of adopted us. And I say us because so much of my childhood is wrapped up with WKY TV. All of the names I mentioned before and so many more that are part of, of what I became and who I am and certainly of my father's life are all over the place. I mean, my lunches at the little snack room in the station before they remodeled Going up the ramp, I must have had a thing for ramps. Going up the ramp uh, at WKY and running up and down with my little brother. Um, all of those things. My father had a synchro retroverter built for my brother and me. You see, 3D Danny was one of our favorite early shows with Danny Williams. And so, 
the art director at the station built a portable synchro retroverter. Now those of you of a certain age will know exactly what I'm talking about. This is what 3D Danny did things on. It was his time machine. It was his spacecraft control. And it was made out of jello molds and plastic spoons and flashing lights and it made noise. And so my brother and I had many, many happy times playing 3D Danny. We even have home movies of it. Well, in the summer, or at fair time rather, Danny Williams would borrow our portable Zebra Retroverter to go out to the Opebco Pavilion and use it when he did his remote shows from out there during the fair. That was fine, sort of, until the year it didn't come back. He had taken it back to the station and it disappeared forever. But in my mind, I will always have my own Synchro Retroverter. These are the kinds of memories I have and this is why I remember being an adopted part of the WKY TV family so much. My father was a pilot. He was an ad man. He was a writer. He was a director and producer of early TV shows. He was an on-camera talent. He had a great voice. He hosted and emceed the first two Stars and Stripes shows that were nationally televised live from Oklahoma City starting in 1976. He spoke when anyone wanted an eloquent speaker, along with many other people in Oklahoma City. He was one of the ones that was thought of. My dad flew until 1986, the summer that my brother was in a horrific plane crash. My brother Steve, he survived, but my dad, after 14,000 hours in the air and a pilot's license since 1936, decided that his days in the air were over because he was so worried about my brother. My brother, now that's another story.